While most people here are fiddling with their pronouns, the world, without asking permission of anyone in Midtown Manhattan, dramatically changed. You don't want to hear it, you don't want to admit it, but America is now off the world's center stage. And now, The Edwin Black Show. Sponsored by the books of Edwin Black. Available on Amazon and at booksellers worldwide. And now, here's Edwin. Welcome to the Edwin Black Show. I'm Edwin Black, investigative journalist, historian, and author of IBM and the Holocaust, War Against the Week, The Far Hood, and numerous other books in 200 editions in 40 languages in 190 countries worldwide. If you like our show's content, spread the word. Subscribe for alerts at theedwinblackshow.com. And if you want to support our work, please visit theedwinblackshow.com slash support. Your help, big or small, assures our complete and utter intellectual and uncensored journalistic independence. We have solidarity today from many fine national organizations, such as the Emerson Family Foundation, the Fuel Freedom Foundation, the Israel on Campus Coalition, as well as Stand With Us, JNS, the Israeli American Council, Emmet, American Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, ZOA Michigan, the Gross Family Center, Americans for Peace and Tolerance, and plenty more. Thank you, everyone. That said, I and my guests only speak for ourselves and for history. Today's episode is sponsored without any preconditions, requests, or stipulations by the Southwest Jewish Congress, which is working every day to bring Jews and Christians together in harmony and mutual respect. Today, we welcome guests from across America, including our four watch parties in the villages, Newton, Mass., Chicago, and Tampa Bay, even if one of those in Tampa Bay is currently in his Tel Aviv hotel. Overseas, I see viewers logged on from, let's go, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Holland, France, Italy, Spain, Germany, South Africa, Great Britain, Canada, Israel, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, El Salvador, India, and here's Taiwan and even China and other countries. If you have a question limited to today's topic, please place one short sentence in Zoom's QA feature. The Edwin Black Show, along with our YouTube site, is global and fast growing, enjoying many tens of thousands of views. We speak frankly and without partisanship to a fragmented world seeking better understanding of our tormented past, our present very, very tense, and a future still uncertain. And remember, we will not be censored. By the way, stay tuned for my special word of wisdom at the very end of the show, just before I sign off. We'll get to our reality-injecting episode, The China Threat 3, in a few minutes. After some brief announcements, plus our latest AI threat update, and then items from the week. Announcements. At the Edwin Black Show and our companion YouTube site, we have just released four more edited and important episodes. First, our exciting Live from Jerusalem show held at the majestic presidential suite of the Waldorf Astoria in Jerusalem. What a gathering. Second, our penetrating explanation of the Israeli judicial reform crisis with eminent attorneys Avi Bell, Nathan Lewin, and Alan Dershowitz. Third, we reached back and edited our unhappy episode, The Death of Journalism, Sad But True. Finally, we have just published the frightening Privacy in Peril 2, recorded at the Turning Point Canadian Privacy Conference earlier this year in Ottawa. See all these videos and hundreds more at theedwinblackshow.com or search YouTube for The Edwin Black Show channel. My appearance tour 
continues across America and overseas. Yesterday, I appeared with my Cincinnati friends at Empower You. At the end of this month, October, I returned to Dallas for an encore presentation at the SMU Embry Human Rights Center discussing Israel and a second lecture for the SMU Jewish Studies Department on IBM and the Holocaust. While I'm there in Dallas, I'll be live in studio for 90 minutes with the Glenn Beck Show. Tune in. From Dallas, I hop a dawn flight to Tampa Bay area for a three-event day. First, a faculty briefing on Israel and Saudi politics, then an interdepartmental lecture on Israel and international law, and finally, I will lead a Shabbat dinner as an alternative to an anti-Jewish hate fest being held elsewhere at USF. In November, I expect to appear in Southern California, God willing. In December, I host congressional friends and eminent speakers for the global launch in the House of Representatives of author Ken Abramowitz's compelling third edition of the multi-front war. I'm already scheduled into the summer of 2024, most notably a three-event January series in South Florida with the Gross Family Center for the Study of Anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, then in February, a return to Mexico City for a powerful community-wide four-event series sponsored by Yad Vashem. In March of next year, I keynote the Canadian Privacy Conference again, this time in Montreal. And next summer, I address ICC's big national student convention in Washington. Get details of all my appearances from edwinblack.com slash events, where my team has restored hundreds of prior event flyers going back 15 years. Thank you, Lance. There you will see information on my many presentations at universities from Harvard to UCLA and before legislatures from the British Parliament to the Israeli Knesset in cities from Sydney, Australia to Brussels to Jerusalem. It's a powerful reminder to me of my years long journey to connect with you, my readers and my viewers, and let us meet up in your city. And now, updating the AI threat. Of the many daily AI threats and developments that we monitor here at the Edwin Black Show, I've selected what I found the most significant of the week. A new term has been coined by the Center for AI Safety. It's rogue AIs. Let's say that again, rogue AIs. The center warns, and I quote, we risk losing control over AIs if they become more capable. AIs could optimize flawed objectives, drift from their original goals, become power seeking, resist shutdown, I'm quoting here, and engage in deception, period, close quote. How is it possible that the developers released a product which is universally considered massively dangerous. If this product were an automobile airbag or a tainted sausage, it would have already been recalled and its manufacturers canceled. It's coming, folks. Actor Tom Hanks just went public to deny that a highly believable imitation of his image was trying to sell dental insurance. Soon, very soon, it will be too late to reverse this danger. Our mental sweet tooth who have given us all a fatal case of hypoglycemic shock. Items from the week. Here we go. First, an update on a travesty of justice involving the bogus trial of Donald Trump for real estate record fraud. That is, exaggerating the value of his many buildings and real estate projects while applying for bank loans. This kangaroo court should frighten everyone. District Attorney Alvin Bragg found the case was not prosecutable on many levels, but several candidates for New York Attorney General ran on the promise, the campaign promise, they would bust Donald Trump and Democrat Letitia James was found the most credible, and so she was elected. The judge selected for this fiasco was Judge Arthur Engeron, who has made a mockery of justice in a fashion I have never seen. Despite the ruling that cameras would be not admitted into the court, 
he did permit some TV cameras in for a brief photo opportunity in which the judge himself was seen preening, smiling, and being giddy for all the attention. Decorum and seriousness was vaporized in a fashion I've never seen in a courtroom. It resembled a clown show. Judge Engeron already found Trump guilty. This allowed his defense, this allowed cross-examination of the evidence, this allowed his attorney under sanction to proffer defenses of statute of limitations. These cases go back to 2011, more than a decade ago, even though the New York Appellate Court has already ruled that 80% of this case is beyond the statute of limitations. He has ruled this judge irrelevant that this is a victimless crime where no bank lost any money, that all were paid and all made millions in interest. And he has disallowed the standard loan application disclaimer that appraisals of subjective factors such as the Trump name brand and location, which would place trillions of local real estate applications in jeopardy, ignored the fact that the banks not only made millions, but were served by the most aggressive real estate appraisers and real estate lawyers in the world. He even claimed, get this, that the sprawling multi-million dollar income producing Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach was only worth $18 million, which has made real estate experts laugh when there are small condos a few blocks away worth $18 million and a much tinier residential home on less than half an acre just near there sold two months ago for $32 million. What the heck is this about? The intent is to assess a confiscatory $250 million penalty for a victimless crime, plus the seizure of his major properties and companies. And a man in San Francisco had the stones to brag to me that this was a great judicial triumph. No one could have picked a more discredited case and judicial process. I have never seen one, and I've covered a lot of courtroom drama. On the other hand, in the two-tier Justice Department, we see that when Hunter Biden received two Chinese wire transfers, and that is a $10,000 wire from Ms. Wang Jin on July 26, 2019 for $10,000, and then about two weeks later, a quarter million dollars from Jonathan Lee and Tan Ling, it was just after Joe Biden announced his run for the White House. Both of those wires listed Joe Biden's personal home as the beneficial address. That's 1201 Barley Mill Road and all paperwork was sent there. That's in Wilmington, Delaware, President Biden's principal home address. It's admitted that the monies were related to the Hunter Front from BHR, which owns shares in a Chinese oil company, which mysteriously received an export of 900,000 barrels of strategic petroleum reserve oil when it was released to help domestic oil prices here in the United States. Next, you have all heard that the Canadian House of Parliament, along with Ukrainian President Zelensky attending, gave a standing ovation to what it called a Ukrainian hero and a Canadian hero, a man called Yaroslav Hunka. They all applauded and hailed him, Zelensky included. Shortly thereafter, it was revealed that Hunka belonged to one of Ukraine's most heinous Nazi military units, the extermination squad known as the Waffen SS Grenadier Division. In utter embarrassment and shame, Prime Minister Trudeau apologized Speaker of the House Rhoda, who invited Hunka, resigned. But now we learn this was not an isolated case. Now we see that the representative of King Charles III in Canada has just expressed, quote, deep regret for giving high honors, the Order of Canada, to Peter Severin, the former chancellor of the University of Alberta. But also um, he's another Ukrainian Nazi who fought in that same Ukrainian unit. It appears that large numbers of Ukrainian Nazis were, were given refuge in Canada and that a special government investigation in the 1980s, the Shainis Commission, found lots of Nazis, but their findings have been kept secret. 
Open those up. This reminds us that Ukraine is loaded with actual World War II Holocaust Nazis with masses of neo-Nazis and his famous Azov Battalion is right now a pure Hitler-loving neo-Nazi formation. We have been trying to support Ukraine nonetheless because a new generation is emerging and Russia is waging a war of merciless territorial aggression against Ukrainian civilians. I urge you to see our special episode entitled What Ukraine Has Done to the Jews, perhaps the best episode we have ever published on the Edwin Black Show. Another reminder that Zelensky should stop shaking down Israel, extorting the Jews for loans and military equipment. A simple thank you for everything that Israel and the Jews are doing for Ukraine would be sufficient. And finally, we turn again to Rice University in Houston, an esteemed campus known for its scientific accomplishments and close association with NASA. Rice University, established in the name of cotton trader and slave owner William Marsh Rice, was established by its charter for, quote, the white inhabitants of Houston and the state of Texas, close quote. It now has an LGBTQ plus association of men and women and men who think they are women who have come together as something called Rice Pride. On Yom Kippur Eve, this anti-Semitic cohort, Rice Pride, declared that LGBTQ Jewish students associated with Rice Hillel were now excluded from Rice Pride, not because of anything the local Hillel did, but because the local campus Hillel is associated with Hillel International, which supports Israel, and to appease its Arab and so-called Palestinian members, Hillel Jews would now be expelled on Yom Kippur to rub it in. This is what Jews are facing if these people get into power in the next election. So with the agony invested in me last week, I declared a cheyram on rice pride, a Jewish curse of untouchability. These pride people can claim they want understanding, inclusion. Yes, unless you are Jew. By the way, if they discover a homosexual in Egypt, he is dragged to a rooftop, tied up and thrown to the pavement to the terrible death. In Iran, they hang them from construction cranes. So rice pride, you're just a bunch of amateur racists like all the others. A harem of untouchability on these pathetic LGBTQ specimens means do not hire them, do not welcome them, do not associate with them, and this harem will last to the end of their conflicted days regardless of any weak need or insincere apology or statement of regret. And it seems the backlash from all quarters is real and penetrating. The group's website at rice.pride.edu has removed its contact page and executive leadership page because they don't have the moral fiber to stand in the sunlight now that their vile stunt has been exposed. Moreover, the Rice administration won't even comment. I called for comment from the senior staff and invited them on the show and never even received a response. They are also hiding I mean specifically, write it down, President Reginald DeRoches, Chief of Staff Ryan Kirksey, Director of Presidential Communications Kimberly Vetter, Provost Amy Dittmar, Dean of Undergraduates Dr. Bridget Gorman, and even News Director, Media Relations Director Jeff Falk. Furthermore, for me, this has just made me see all the violence and hatred that emerges from this LGBTQ and cult of personality conflict they have proliferated. Guys who think lipstick makes you a woman or a girl have been attacking biological girls. One was videotaped violently being assaulted from behind a young innocent girl in Tulane, Oregon middle school. He was pulling her hair and beating her senseless Another transgender person in Nashville went on a mass shooting spree, killing six innocents in a school. In May of this year, a transgender person publicly testified before the San Francisco Board of Supervisors by screeching a long, extended, blood-curdling scream. 
My advice to LGBTQ, if you are campaigning for understanding, compassion and tolerance, lose the anti-Semitism, especially on Yom Kippur. If any of you rainbow warriors have a problem, please call me. One final note today is a note of optimism in Israel, believe it or not. The so-called Israel democracy protest movement has been exposed as a sham. They are not a majority or even a near majority, as if they were, they could convince one of the six coalition parties to do what is commonly done, break with the coalition, which would overthrow the Bibi Netanyahu government. These protest people, trust me, they're smart, they're good looking, they're hip dudes. They know how to manipulate the media, especially when their allies in the English language is Israel media, my colleagues, are part and parcel of their movement. They want a Supreme Court without reform or rules, where anything goes and the Israeli Supreme Court can act as a lower court, a middle court, and an upper appellate court all at once, ruling on anything at once, regardless of whether there is a legitimate case. They have no problem overruling the Knesset and will even decide which elected leader can remain elected. The protesters want you to believe Israel vaunted democracy is in peril. Baloney! The Supreme Court in Great Britain has no power to overrule Parliament. The UK, like Israel, has no codified constitution. Germany, like Israel, has only one parliamentary house, the Bundestag. And while all this irritating fascist style, military extortion and disruptive protest is going on, the BB government is on the urge of ushering in unheard of peace and prosperity initiative with countries in Africa, Asia, and now a fabulous potential peace with Saudi Arabia that will relegate the kleptocratic do-nothing terrorist funding Palestinian Authority to just another handout waiting for a bakshish handout and unable to stop the rest of the Middle East from turning away from its violent past and embracing peace and peaceful coexistence. No one can update us as expertly on the Israeli judicial reform movement and what is about to happen that could be huge other than international jurist Avi Bell speaking to us from Jerusalem. Avi, take five and tell us where the process is right now. All right, thank you very much for having me. And I will speak quickly and to the point because I'm on the clock. Um, there are two distinct aspects to the judicial reform controversy. There were important events that took place on both aspects, and I'll try to cover them both quickly. Um, the first aspect has to do with the anti-reformers. The anti-reformers um, describe themselves as being pro-democracy and against uh, uh, judicial reform. They certainly are against judicial reform, but um, what they're for, what they're fighting against is a little bit more complex. The, the Really, the anti-reform movement comes from four different vectors. Um, one of them is actually about uh, judicial reform. This is, let's call these guys the aristocrats. These are the people that, uh, you know, the, the judges themselves, the legal advisors, the attorney generals, the former attorney general, um, the former justices, those people who want to join this club, lawyers and uh, legal academics who feel that they have to uh, suck up to the, to the judges. These are the people who are really in, interested in unlimited power for the judges. These people are not uh, particularly influential in the movement. Uh, they do provide intellectual cover. The second group, the second vector from which the anti-reform movement is coming, is, let's call these guys the thugs. Uh, the most prominent member here is former Prime Minister Ehud Barak, who famously about uh, three years ago, while briefing activists about what he wanted, he described a plan for a movement of popular protests, harassments, and violence that was uh, going to be targeted at bringing down the government, uh, in particular Netanyahu, and that would be described to the public as being pro-democracy. Now, when Barack was uh, uh, got to the point, what's the end point of this thing? Well, he described it as a scenario in which there would be dead bodies floating in the Yarkon River in Tel Aviv, and then people would come to him and ask him to assume the mantle of leadership. He left out the laurel, but his meaning was clear. Now, not all of the people of Thugs are uh, Barack delusional. The Yair Lapid, for example, Benny Gantz are with this 
this crowd, but their aim is more simple. It's simply to bring down the government through instability. Uh, bodies in the Arcon are necessary, but apparently um, not undesired. Um, now, the thugs are extremely important to the uh, anti-reform movement because they're the logistics of it. They're the, the money, the signs, the logistical organization bringing people out to intimidate, to harass, to block roads, to uh, destroy military readiness of, of various military units, to encourage boycott and divestment, to destroy reputations, um, to engage in violence and to threaten uh, people uh, with murder. Now, um, this group uh, had a setback this week. The third vector is, um, let's call these people the elitists or the bigots. Um, this is who the, the group that uh, Israeli sociologist Baruch Kimmerling called back in the day a Husalim, that is veteran Israeli secular Ashkenazi socialist Jews. And these guys view themselves as the traditional elite in charge of everything. They are a very, very prominent part of the anti-reform movement. They are probably the bulk of the people who are out on the streets. And what they're trying to fight for is to protect their hegemony. And it's a movement basically of hate, hate against those people who are not Ashkenazi, that is primarily Middle East and North African Jews, who are not secular, that is all, all religious Jews, non-veteran Israelis, that is uh, uh, immigrants, olim, and the like. Uh, and of course, uh, non-socialists, that is uh, capitalists, liberals, etc. Now, um, there's a fourth group, and these are the, let's call them the lemmings. These are the people who have been shamelessly manipulated by the, manip the uh, media campaign, which has followed all the talking points of the thugs uh, using the intellectual pro cover provided by the aristocrats. But these people are, for the most part, sane. They can be reached. And this is where the event of the last week is important. On Yom Kippur, the thugs, that is so-called pro-democracy organizations, the Kaplan movement, Brothers in Arms, etc., all the ones that are organized by Ehud Barak's merry band of rebels, and that have been taking the lead in organizing for several months, all of the street protests, as well as all the other public campaigns against uh, judicial reform, they attacked or organized attacks on public worship of Jews in various cities throughout uh, Israel. The public worship was done in uh, on the streets. It was organized by a bunch of uh, religious Jews who were trying to bring um, religious and non-religious Jews to engage in low pressure worship together. It included secular people and religious people. It was on the one day of the, the, the calendar where it was presumed that most people, even non-religious Jews, um, have some connection with uh, with Yom Kippur, and the uh, um, the protest groups violently disrupted the the worship ceremonies in a dozen different places. Um, their excuse was that it was a vigilante action because in Tel Aviv the the city had outlawed in the public prayer use of separation curtains between men and women, and one of the Tel Aviv locations for one of the prayers. The worshippers used a makeshift barrier. And so in all of these dozen locations, the self-styled vi vigilantes disrupted and upset the prayer. Now, when Yom Kippur was over and it became clear what, uh, what had happened, Lapid and Gantz came out and condemned the worshippers. They said, described their holding prayers in so-called liberal cities to be a provocation. Um, and they had no place there. Netanyahu condemned the disruptors, condemned the thugs who had disrupted the, the, the worship. Initially, the protest movements backed Lapid and Gantz, said that, you know, went on the attack against the so-called provocateurs, people who were praying. After a short while, it became clear that they'd lost the public. And so now the uh, when the, the, the protests went out and they were down by more than half of their numbers, um, the, the protest groups shifted their focus. Um, they announced that really their problem was not uh, the provocation of prayer. Their problem was that Netanyahu was dividing the public by calling out the thugs. I doubt that this is going to work. I think that the mask has been ripped off. I think that a lot more of the Israeli public that has been following the destructive efforts of the anti-reform aristocrats, thugs, and bigots are going to see where they're going, going to refuse to be lemmings, and the protest movement is going to lose steam. That's one of the. The other thing, and this one's much briefer, this is on the matter of the judicial 
aristocracy itself, the judicial overreach. So um, right now, before the Supreme Court, there are two different cases that are extremely important. As you may know, only a single one of the reform bills has been passed so far. It is one that limits the power of the court to engage in uh, rewriting policies that were made by uh, the elected government or ministers, that is to use so-called reasonableness reviews to change uh, the policy, to to fire people, to hire people, et cetera. Um, The court is reviewing that bill and another bill, one that uh, clarifies the meaning of incapacity to, to serve as prime minister in the case of physical ailment. It's reviewing both of them for their constitutionality. Now, there's a problem with this. And the problem is, of course, that uh, there is no constitution. So there's no discernible grounds in the law anywhere for the court to strike these things down. There's an additional problem that the court is striking down or considering striking down the very bills that regulate the court's power. That is, the court is saying that it is above the law, there is no way that elected officials can reimpose the law on the court because the court will simply ignore it, throw it aside, and do whatever it wants. Now, uh, hearings were held in both of these cases. No ruling has yet come out. No ruling will come out for a while. But we have to understand that the very fact that they've held these hearings, placed themselves above the law, announced that they're going to not respect any legal process that reforms their powers or that limits their powers puts us in a very, very tight situation. So while the thugs have suffered a real defeat this past week, the aristocrats are riding high, and it's not clear where this is going to end up. And thank you for that, Avi. And I suppose if the court attempts to overrule the the reasonableness legislation, that this could put Israel on a constitutional collision course and all hell can break loose, correct? Absolutely. Well, what we're looking at is, is, is it put the government in an impossible situation because on the one hand, it wants to follow the rule of law and it's clear what the law says. On the other hand, it doesn't want to disobey the court and the court will be disobeying the law. The court will be putting itself opposite the rule of law. And so the the court only has one venue for enforcement, and that is the executive, correct? That's, well, formally it doesn't, it only has that. The the, One of the questions will be what happens when uh, the thugs and the bigots decide that it's more important to topple the government than to follow the rule of law. And so um, they give their instructions to their followers, their goons in the military, don't listen to the law, listen to the court. Well, all right. Now, the last question is, where the heck are you? Is that a fake backdrop or are you in, in the law library at uh, Hebrew University? <laughs> I'm always in a virtual library and this is very, very much a virtual library. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Avi, and uh, we'll see you back on the show soon, and you and I will get together to lift one shortly, either here or there. And now, ladies... Thanks for having me. Let me just say, regards to Josh. All right. (laughs) And don't forget Zalmi uh, in London. All right. And now for today's topic, the next installment of The China Threat, Part 3, a recent Pew Research poll asked Americans to name, without any prompting, this country's greatest threat. 50% of them volunteered China. Only 17% said Russia, and only 2% listed North Korea. Here is some truth. While most people here are fiddling with their pronouns, the world, without asking permission of anyone in Midtown Manhattan, dramatically changed. You don't want to hear it, you don't want to admit it, but America is now off the world's center stage. We're not off rolling on the floor yet. We're still in the wings, but we're no longer managing global affairs, which means global affairs are managing us. There are 8.1 billion people on this planet. America's population is 332 million. Two countries right next to each other in Asia, two neighbors, China and India, now each hold 1.25 billion people with India edging out to be the world's most populated and crowded nation. These people, they have cell phones, they have great intellect, 
artistic prowess. They have engineering genius. They have risen to the front of the fleet of nations. Indians have given the world many gifts. Ethnic Indian people are now running the UK government, Microsoft, Google, Visa, and a host of major American corporations. Indian Americans are running for president of the United States right now. India is the globe's largest and most vibrant democracy. Flawed, yes. Fractured, yes. Ethnically torn, but a flourishing democracy. China is possessed of an amazing culture and a prodigious academic and artistic genius. China is a communist dictatorship with the stated goal of taking charge of the world and dominating it and displacing America from its global domination within 10 years, perhaps this decade. China is succeeding. While you were giggling at your TikTok feeds, China was figuring out how to outplan, outinvest, outbribe, outinfiltrate, outdiploma, outsubvert, and basically outsteamroller America on the ground, on the seas, in the air, in outer space, and in the nano world that we cannot see and most of us cannot fathom. China's Navy is the largest in the world, 780 ships and just as many naval aircraft manned by 240,000 men and women, three aircraft carriers, 62 destroyers, and 23 submarines. America, yes, operates almost three times as many with 53 fast attack submarines, 14 ballistic missile submarines, and four guided missile submarines. Yes, but America patrols the world and China is just preparing. China has already created a series of man-made islands militarized with giant airstrips, massive radar installations, warship harbors, and depots, and it claims these as Chinese territory. Most of these are highly developed military installations hosting small but modern cities of support personnel. China has more than 400 nuclear bombs and is building vast nuclear silo farms for a thousand more. Great Britain has 260 nukes. China promises to invade Taiwan within the next few years and practices every day with mock mixed force assaults surrounding Taiwan from all sides. When Taiwan goes, with it goes 68% of the world's semiconductors, but 90% of the most advanced ones. And these are the ones needed to operate computerized things. Big and small, and just one company, TSMC, controls most of that. China spies on the world. They have embedded spy software in TikTok, in 5G routers, in cargo cranes, in its Confucius Institutes embedded through our nation's campuses, as Ken Abramowitz wrote about, in subterfuge Chinese police stations hidden above grocery stores and in obscure office buildings in Chinatowns and major cities, and in the bedrooms of women sent to entrap American congressmen and chauffeur them around, and undoubtedly in the phones and electronics carried by members of the Biden crime family racketeering enterprise, from the sex and dope trafficking of Hunter Biden to the millions it has funded into Joe Biden's Penn Center Institute, to the millions of bribery dollars it has injected into the Biden shakedown and influence racket. China has loaned money and expertise to the third and emerging world in all hemispheres on terms so beneficial it becomes irresistible. When the country's default, China seizes their infrastructure, much as Great Britain did to the Turks when Istanbul was trapped by the Ottoman Debt Commission, and much as American companies took over German enterprise when they defaulted on their World War I Versailles Treaty obligations. What they could not conquer with spears, they have conquered with women and with drugs and with the power of bribery, sheer greed, and sophisticated monetary traps. China is in all our medicines, our manufacturing, our materials, 
because they seduced rapacious American business with the seductive dream of cheap slave labor to build this or that, shoe and hat, thin and fat, all for a few pennies less. China controls North Korea, which can wage proxy nuclear war in the same fashion we are waging a proxy war with Russia by arming and financing Ukraine just for the purpose of depleting Russia's military power. And now we have diverted so many of our 155 millimeter artillery shells. If we waged war over Taiwan, our supply would be exhausted and not replenishable after just 10 days. So who's smart now? Mostly, China is light years ahead of us in AI. We're still trying to figure out what it means, and they are trying to calculate when to use it against our society. At the moment, China possesses vastly more quantum computing power than we do. And remember, each quantum computer is millions of times faster than a supercomputer. I've left out 99% of everything, so my learned guest can contribute his share. I give you Hudson Institute foreign policy analyst and Democratic Party strategist Josh Block. Josh, take it and tell me I am exaggerating the Chinese threat. Edwin, uh, that was a very complete uh, recitation of things. I mean, I think one issue we didn't talk about in the introduction is fentanyl, which, as you know, is poisoning uh, American of all ages, particularly uh, children and those who are being poisoned. We, we saw just two weeks ago that in a preschool in New York, police found a stash of fentanyl uh, under the floor and on children's play mats. Uh, you know, that the equivalent of one matchstick head of fentanyl is enough to kill a human being. So China is the production house of these fentanyl chemicals. And the United States recently uh, sanctioned a, a range of companies that were involved in this uh, trade. But it's using Mexico as a transshipment point, and it, it's poisoning America directly, not even indirectly, through some of these long-term threats. You mentioned also the space race. China is investing enormous resources. It's a command economy. So what we're really seeing in the great power competition that between the United States or U.S. and our allies versus China is a you know capital economy versus the, the command economy, and they're able to launch. Uh, you know, the equivalent of our largest rocket once a day, what well, we do it maybe four times a year. The quantum computing threat you mentioned is not just a battle for computing power. It's the, it's the determining factor of who will control uh, codes and, and secrecy and privacy for the next 50 to 70 years and perhaps beyond. And uh, China just last, uh, last week connected a remote network of multiple quantum computers. The throughput of its network was small, but it is a beginning step that we have not been able to accomplish. And so, you know, whether it's space, whether it's quantum computing, whether it's the drug trade, uh, China is acting directly against the interests of the United States. Um, in other parts of the world, as you mentioned, debt diplomacy has been an extraordinarily uh, powerful tool for China, whether they're, they control huge uh, stores of global precious resource, precious mineral uh, rare earth mineral stores, and they continue to acquire more both by purchase, but also by one might see as economic extortion. So, you know, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, which was initially uh, conceived as a way for them to support international development, has resulted in, the, in China be giving more money away uh, to support its own companies and to support the debt development and indebtedness of developing nations around the world, more than the World Bank and for the IMF, so annually. So these efforts are not to be dismissed. And you mentioned as well the effort of China to expand its presence in what has been international waterways in the South, particularly the South China Sea. And the United States has been for generations the guarantor of free trade, of free navigation of the seas, uh, because without it, the world can't engage in the free exchange of goods and, and the development of trade. And so I would ask just, you know, quickly, what do we think the dollar is worth? What is the U.S. dollar worth? Well, the U.S. dollar is worth what it is because it's the, the currency of global trade. And China and its other uh, anti-international partners in the BRICS group and others want to replace the dollar as the, the currency of global trade. And the answer, of course, is the dollar is worth what the American military is willing to say it is worth by enforcing that freedom of navigation, that freedom of trade, that continuing presence of the United States as the guarantor of the international economy, the trade economy uh, around the world. 
And if freedom uh, recedes and totalitarianism begins to uh, take its place, we're going to be not only disadvantaged in these other technological areas, but we're also going to be disadvantaged in, in a trade and economic space that the United States has known leadership for many decades. So it, the, when you look around the world today and you see the Russia, China, Iran, North Korea axis, and make no mistake that Russia and China, uh, Iran and North Korea form a an arc of nuclear threat and security threat that faces the United States in an unparalleled sense, uh, it, you know, Perhaps historically speaking, uh, we need to be ready to confront these issues uh, powerfully. And, you know, the, the world is watching when the United States treats our allies uh, shabbily, when we don't, uh, when we, we kick over longtime friends, whether it's in Egypt and, and embrace uh, those who come after them, even if they're Muslim Brotherhood terrorists, or we hesitate to support our allies in Israel and their effort to stop Iran's nuclear program. We're really just giving a green light to China to invade uh, Taiwan. When we hesitate to confront Russian incursion of Georgia uh, or parts of Ukraine, and now this is why we find ourselves in the situation we are with the the war over Ukraine itself, uh, we permit bad actors to think that they have permission to to violate others and, and seize territory like Taiwan, in which case we're treaty bound to intervene. So unless we want to encourage a war uh, in Asia, we need to act forcefully now to uh, and Iran's illicit nuclear weapons program and show both Vladimir Putin and China that the United States has a power uh, that is unpredictable and would be a mistake for them to to face. And there are cracks in China. There are weaknesses there. You've seen the disappearance of their foreign minister, of their defense minister, of some of the members of their uh, uh, elite military who, who have been disappearing, whether it's under strange political circumstances or under the accusation of, of corruption. And Xi's power is beginning to be questioned. There are problems with the way they handled uh, the COVID emergency and, and the rise in unemployment of people uh, under the age of 30. Uh, you know, these are structural problems. China doesn't have enough arable land to grow the food that it needs because of its, uh, the way its ge- geography works and the, the development of its city-states. There are problems there, but unless we begin to act in a serious way and uh, begin to uh, to reinforce our role as a global leader and our position as the guarantor of free trade, free economy, and free commerce around the world through our military strength, we're going to find ourselves increasingly on the weaker end of that fight. And as you say, China is directing its resources in very pragmatic and thorough ways to uh, unseat us in that regard. That was a uh, an excellent presentation, and there's so much we didn't discuss but we have discussed in prior episodes of the China threat. We didn't discuss fentanyl, but I'm happy that you brought it up. And we didn't discuss uh, their involvement in the BRICS. You mentioned the BRICS. That's B-R-I-C-S. And that stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which 13 years ago formed their own economic coalition. And they'd be happy to replace the dollar. So I'm going to go right to our questions because uh, we have so many of them. Question number one from the watch party in the villages, and that is, can China be defeated in its intentions? Go ahead. Yeah, there's no question that China's uh, effort to replace the United States as the world's most powerful uh, nation militarily, economically, and politically uh, is not foretold. There's no question that if the United States and our allies begin to take seriously the China threat, and I think we've seen some indications that the Biden administration has strengthened the the policies that the Trump administration began with regard to uh, trade with China, balancing the trade, enforcing some of these uh, manufacturing trends to return manufacturing to the United States and, and put it in in friendly countries, whether it's the production of uh, precursors to uh, pharmaceuticals or other uh, you know key components for our uh, electronics or, or parts of civilian life, military life, that we can uh, defeat and turn back Chinese influence. But we can't do it if we continue to blithely skip along and do deals where a company like General Electric agrees to access, and again, General Electric no longer exists in the form it used to, but General Electric agreed 20 years ago to go into China for access to its markets to sell airplane engines in return for a a knowledge and technology transfer that within 20 years would make them obsolete and give all of that knowledge and power to a Chinese company. And so that kind of knowledge transfer, that sort of 
naive uh, desire to make money by entering these markets to provide them with the technology and the training and the tools that they don't have is a problem. Uh, and we need to be more aware of some of the trends that we've been discussing, and including things like China making an effort to hire uh, the, the former military pilots to come to China, whether it's from Australia or, the, or Great Britain or the United States or France or other allies, and teach them how to land airplanes on aircraft carriers, for example, which they have been recruiting and using cutout companies to do. And so people need to be aware of these things, we need to crack down on that kind of conduct and insist whether it's individuals, former, former military officials, corporations, governments, take seriously these threats and begin to act against them in, in meaningful ways. And I think, you know, we can stop them, but we have to take actions that would put us in position to be able to do that and to deter them. Well, you know, you are so right. And these pilots that they've tried to entice from uh, allied countries, including Anglo countries, to teach them how to land on aircraft carriers, all about they're projecting military power across the oceans. Amongst the other things we didn't discuss was their involvement in this fake climate policy that is ruling our country, especially with regard to electric vehicles, which relies upon rare earth elements. Now, climate change and climate hazard and the danger to the climate, that's real. But this idea that it's all going to be solved by inducing China to build a coal plant once a week to give us these batteries, just absolutely absurd. We also didn't discuss China's significant cultural involvement in Hollywood. One week, or maybe it was a month, they suddenly bought up all the studios. And uh, now you could always look for those credits. There's always, the executive producer is always called Jones and Williams, but then look for the co-executive producer is usually a Chinese name. Let's go to our second question. Our watch party in Newton, Massachusetts, which where they invented the Fig Newton, as Josh well knows. How is it so many thousands of Chinese infiltrators are coming across the Southern border? Well, I did a little research on this, and about 10,000 single Chinese men have infiltrated at the southern border, the Mexico border, this year alone, and about 4,300 in the past 120 days. What do you know about this, Josh? Why are they coming here, and what's their plan? Well, I, you know, I'd say just as worrisome as those sneaking across the border are the folks who are working in research institutions and that have been stealing and transmitting uh, uh, secrets back to China from in legitimate uh, ways that we're permitting. So not only is there a problem with uh, illegal immigration, and that's not just unique to threats like China, it's also terrorists. You know, once you have uh, what's called tubing, if you can put uh, drug, you can smuggle drugs or other illicit substances through a pathway. You can you can smuggle weapons or people, uh, and so you know the presence of Chinese uh, spying in the United States, both overt and covert, is a serious concern. And again, whether it's uh, the money that's being funneled into high universities of higher education, or it's folks who are working in uh, defense contractors and then have been convicted in, of spying on the United States, whether they're, they're coerced into it by the Chinese government or they're doing it because they're sent here as part of the Chinese uh, security services, uh, or they're sneaking in the country to, to work as part of the triads to further the, the, uh, the drug trade, to further the illicit uh, trading of human beings, to make money uh, in illegal ways and undermine our economy and our security, all of these things are direct threats to the United States and need to be addressed uh, urgently. No question about it. Okay. Our next question is from the watch party in Chicago. Are there any Chinese police stations in Chicago itself? I'm going to say probably yes, but and I'm sure Ken Abramowitz would know, but um, I know the location, and we dealt with it on this show before the FBI busted them. We know about the location in New York City, Los Angeles. There's one in Houston, one in San Francisco, and also in several small cities of Nebraska and Minnesota near sensitive military and strategic installations. I don't know about the one in Chicago. What do you know about that, Josh? I don't know about Chicago particularly, but this story is one that, that merits more attention. It's not just in the United States that the Chinese government is establishing uh, foreign outposts, undeclared foreign outposts of its security services and police, and attempting to uh, intervene in disputes inside American cities among Americans, among American immigrants from China that they should have no involvement in. 
um, setting up spying operations, setting up punishment things, even rendering people out of the country uh, illegally. So the fact that police stations, as they call them, exist is a dangerous, dangerous thing and something that you know needs to be addressed, not just here in the United States, but in major cities uh, in Europe as well. Uh, and I'm sure in, in South Asia and you know in the South Pacific, the effort by the Chinese government to intervene in, in other countries is remarkable. And I think at the same time, we need to remember that China is acting more aggressively against uh, citizens of foreign countries in China itself, putting exit bans on, uh, you know, on executives, non-Chinese executives working for companies that have presence in, in China. So not only are they uh, establishing these security presences in our country and in the other countries in the West, but then now they're forcefully acting using their security services against citizens not of Chinese uh, uh, passport in their own countries and preventing them from leaving the country to come home whether it's Japan or Australia, the United States or other countries. So there's a predatory uh, trend here that is of, of some serious concern and just out of the norms of diplomatic, political and on other behaviors. And that's a trend that we see with the Chinese government, just thinking that they can do and get away with uh, whatever kind of conduct uh, they want. All right. Here's a couple of questions, public ones, uh, based on my pre-mono. This is from Yakov. I think Yakov is in... Florida somewhere, correct me if I'm wrong, Yaakov, uh, surely Mr. Trump can prove the value of Mar-a-Lago from the latest property taxes he paid. And I'll answer that. First of all, what is a fair market value? The universal definition of a fair market value, that's the one adopted by business, uh, the real estate profession, and the IRS taxing bodies, is what a reasonable buyer would reasonably pay a reasonable seller uh, for a given property. And by extension, what a independent banker would independently loan to a, a lender based on that property. So if a guy says, I've got a blank canvas here and I'm going to declare to be a work of art and somebody decides to pay $20,000 for it, that's the fair market value. I suppose Hunter Biden is now a expert at blowing crap through a store, through a straw and calling it art and picking up a quarter of a million dollars. So it's whatever a willing person will pay. Now, there are other types of valuations. There's replacement value. When you have insurance uh, and your house burns down, they only give you what it would take to replace the building. That's the cost of materials. There's assessment value. There's uh, uh, all types of insured value. Uh, there's brand value. So when you pay your taxes, you usually pay on assessed valuation, which not only governs what your house is worth, but what it's worth within your neighborhood. So that's the answer. Did you want to add anything to that, Josh? No, I, I think that covers it. Okay. Here's from San Francisco. So under your logic, because I called this a victimless crime because everybody made millions, uh, including the state of New York. So under your logic, Hunter Biden's activities amounted to a victimless crime. Now let's look at this question. A victimless crime, Hunter Biden. In what world is sex trafficking of women a victimless crime? Under In what world is causing events to occur that a gun is dropped off at a, a trash can at a schoolyard a victimless crime? In what world is international drug trafficking uh, consorting with dealers and sellers, all of which is a crime and all of which is invested in a crime. And uh, in what world, San Francisco, is this a victimless crime? In what world is bribery a victimless crime? In what world, even if it's a world that begins somewhere out in San Francisco, is representing selling access to the president of the United States or even the senator of New Jersey. In what world is that a victimless crime when the people are made victims by the fact that people are representing foreign interests, they're doing it secretly, they're not registered by FARA. On the other hand, if somebody says, give me a million bucks and I'll build a building 
and make it even bigger and everybody thrives and everybody gets their money and the tax revenue is increased and no one's complaining, that could be a victimless crime. So thank you for your question, San Francisco. Did you want to add anything to that, uh, Josh? Not particularly, but I will say that one of the biggest victims of the the, uh, the whole Hunter Biden saga has been the credibility of the press. And when the stories of, of this laptop that contains so much of the evidence that's been produced in the last you know, couple of years initially came out during the political campaign, uh, the effort to discredit the evidence as a Russian hoax was taken up very quickly by the press and used on social media to ban the story. And in for, of course, it in fact turned out to be true. Uh, so, you know, once again, it undermined public faith in media and trust and in the kind of common denominator of, of what's actually true and can be judged out there. And so I think it's important to remember that not only is, are the victims in the political space, but also it's kind of it's, our, it's a society that suffered as a result of the failure uh, r- related to some of these stories. OK, uh, we have another question here from Joel in, uh, I think it's San Diego. He asked a question last week. Have the Chinese gained access to Hunter Biden and the White House? I'm going to think about it long and hard. And I'm going to say, I think so. Because if they can plant spyware in your phones and in your devices, and you have unrestricted access even to the situation room, uh, and sometimes Someone could even, I don't know who could leave a cocaine bag there. If you have unrestricted access to the president, I would say they've gained access to Hunter Biden and the White House. You have a thought about that, Josh? Well, it's not just that story and and the access and the the $5 million sent over from the Chinese company in the conversation. It's also the fact that just recently the United States government announced that Chinese uh, individuals have been trying to gain access and had been gaining access to sensitive military facilities around the United States, both posing as tourists and pretending to be other than they are and trying to vi- and, and violating the, the perimeters of these institutions to uh, these military installations to gather intelligence. So again, just another example of the kind of penetration that's there. And, and the technology that China uses is very sophisticated. The hacks that they've perpetrated, the information they've been able to exfiltrate from uh, U.S. government, sensitive U.S. government and corporate uh, systems, you know, obvious and concerning. All right. Melanie in Jacksonville, does China track the tourists who travel there and install software on their phone? Uh, I'm going to answer first and I'll let... Um, uh, Josh re- reply. It depends on what you call tourists, but if we use the word traveler and we say businessmen and tourists, I think that China has well more than a hundred million visitors a year from other countries, and absolutely, uh, there's going to be an opportunity for them to insert software, tracking software, et cetera, et cetera, and once they leave. Um, uh, China, they take that software with them. Have you been to China, uh, Josh, and what do you do? Well, as everyone knows that when you travel to China, whatever electronic device that you take with you should not be your current device. And that when you come home, the temporary device that you take with you should be thrown in the trash. Uh, that's been standard practice for American government employees for more than uh, a decade and a half. And um, I think is probably prudent. A lot of business folks uh, apply the same uh, techniques. I know people who have been in hotels in China and seen the monitor, the person monitoring them behind the mirror, uh, actually seen them through the mirror. Uh, you know, th- there is a lot of surveillance that goes on in China. It's a police state. They have enormous, uh, almost inexhaustible resources to throw at these issues, at these problems. Their technology is very strong. They can exfiltrate the data from your electronic devices without touching it, without being anywhere near it, not physically uh, coming in contact with it. We all remember that uh, Edward Snowden, when he fled the United States with the, the laptops that he took, he went to, chi- went to China and he shoved them in a freezer and held them in, in, inside a metal box in effort to, to uh, protect them from, so he could still trade them, presumably, because he, he knew he took them there. You know, so this is the place where you know, all, whatever you take in, there, uh, no, nothing remains secret. Are, but uh, Josh, aren't you uh, supposed to, when you're looking at the guy through the mirror, aren't you supposed to make sure you're not seen through that mirror? Don't they have quality mirrors in these hotel rooms? I, I guess sometimes the, the the smoke in the mirror fades. Okay. And I should mention that China knows how to uh, implement the man in the middle 
uh, which means you're in the airport and your phone is working and they got a guy uh, just down from you. He's receiving your signal and transmitting it. So they're sucking everything up. We have, does Rita in Century City, are you just raising your hand to say, when are you coming out here in California to see me? Or do you have a question? If you have a question, put it in the chat or the QA thing. We see your hand. Hi, Rita. All right. We have another question here. Uh, China's economy is struggling. This is true due to its COVID and one child policies. And those one child policies, a generation later, are starting to roost. How this comes from Christine in Indiana. How much is this compromised the country of China? And I think it's a legitimate question. Go ahead, Josh. Well, there are, again, as we talked about, there are structural weaknesses in China that should be concerning. Their their inability to grow enough food, the 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 rec- real estate speculation bubble that exists there, the uh, numbers of buildings, apartments. Uh, that are that are empty. That uh, where the the companies that have been uh, financed by the government using tens of billions of dollars are essentially insolvent, and so artificially propping up uh, their stock exchange. The tens of millions of, of Chinese citizens who hold nominal shares in these companies. You know the the corruption that plagues their system. Uh, you know the, these are serious problems. It's of course uh, evident that China has. A power struggle taking place, even though they have a str- they have strong autocratic leadership. Uh, at the last Chinese Party Congress, you saw Hu Jintao, the many you know the leader who liberalized their economy in many ways and and tried, tried to have kind of a an authoritarian government, but a more uh, trading culture, economic culture, was horse collared out of the meeting by Xi. Uh, and since then, as I mentioned, the, the foreign minister, the defense minister, and top leaders of their missile programs and others have, have just disappeared from the public sphere. And they put under house arrest several of their most prominent entrepreneurs, Jack, started with Jack Ma, uh, the founder of Alibaba, and others, to bring them to heel. They cracked down on his effort to start a cryptocurrency or kind of a digital currency trading uh, company. And so they are concerned about uh, the lack of, of control over certain elements of their economy. And there are weaknesses there. So no question about it. And the unemployment problem that continues to plague them and creates greater and greater unrest. And you're seeing a shift of population out of the city centers into the rural areas, uh, the opposite of what China was trying to accomplish for, for many decades and going against government policy. People beginning to, to, um, to decide that they want to uh, not participate in this, in this uh, economic centralization that they're trying to accomplish. So there are trends that go uh, against China's uh, continued prosperity. But we'll see whether uh, they're predominant or not. And again, this battle between the con- command economy, where the, comp- where the country has a lot of resources, it has controls these rare earth minerals, it's designing and pushing a system around the world where we're going to spend more money on batteries than we will on the creation of power or um, natural resources, you know, pro- is a trend that we need to be- pay attention to. Uh, here's another question from the Bay Area. Mr. Trump is accused of inflating his properties by as much as 10 times their appraised value to gain loans to and undervalue those same properties by as much as 10% when reporting them on his income tax forms. This is not a real question because you don't pay tax on perceived value of the property. You pay tax on the uh, actual income generated by the property. And I should say, if you've got a bank a giant bank 300 feet away from a property or a half a mile away from a property and they have the biggest appraisers in the land and they know what they're doing. And some guy says, don't listen to my, he has a disclaimer. It says, don't believe anything we say, do your own appraisal. And they lend $5 million and they collect it all and everybody benefits. Uh, that's not criminal behavior. This uh, remark says, The courts believe so, but you do not. Actually, the courts do not believe so. Basically, you've got a rogue judge who very shortly will be have shown to have ruled. He even implied this was happening, that 80 percent of the case should have never been brought because it's outside the statute of limitations. You know, it's very frightening to see an attempt to take away all this guy's uh, property and all of his uh, wealth to make sure he doesn't run against Joe Biden. There is no possibility that if he would have uh, just gone down to a peanut farm and been quiet, 
uh, no one would have indicted, in, indicted him for anything. Do you agree with that, Josh? Yeah, and I think you know the the point that you made at the uh, it was to me, which is the most salient, is that the that the any loan that he took um, would have been provided by a bank that theoretically was uh, establishing its perspective on the value of the collateral to, uh, against it, which it was loaning. So I'm not sure uh, why they would be uh, considering that that Trump or the company misrepresented the value when in fact. Whatever value they report, the bank, it's up to the bank to decide what they think those assets are worth uh, in that transaction, at least as I understand it. It would actually be criminal for a bank to give out loans without doing its due diligence. That would be called favoritism. Uh, anyway, listen, guys, we're out of time. I know we could have talked longer. I want you to hold for my closing word of wisdom just uh, one and a half minutes away. Read it, don't go anywhere. But first, I want to thank my esteemed guest, Avi Bell. And the knowing Josh Block. I also thank my talented international team, including Richard in the Philippines, Wes in the Bay Area, John in Japan, Nick in London, and Carol in Maryland for their outstanding work, as well as many others in numerous additional cities around the world. My team, each of them, is comprised of very dedicated people. I am. we all owe them. I'll see everyone back here next week at 3 p.m. You want to be a friend of The Edwin Black Show? Go to theedwinblackshow.com slash support. Keep me independent. You want to hear me in person? Watch my website for events. I'm in Dallas and Tampa end of this month. I'll see you there. Harv in Southern California next month. Gotcha, Grant. will be with the Emersons. Consult my events page at edwinblack.com. Until then, head over to any Barnes & Noble in the USA or Amazon, Walmart, Apple, or Cobalt platform in 190 countries across this roiling, toiling, boiling planet where you can find any of my 200 book editions, such as IBM and the Holocaust, soon to be a major Hollywood blockbuster if God will only also knock off the actor's strike. Want an autographed copy? Hit my personal newly redesigned website. Thank you, Wes. Edwinblack.com and click books. Get access alerts to participate live in future shows at the edwinblackshow.com. You'll see a much enhanced and exquisitely produced version of this show in prior episodes by subscribing to our YouTube channel at the Edwin Black Show and click the notification button like tens of thousands of others. You will love them. We put new ones up each week produced by a bold international crew. Follow me at Edwin Black Book on that thing called X as well as Facebook. And now... For my closing word of wisdom, ready? True wisdom begins when we comprehend just how much we cannot comprehend. Thank you, world. I'm zooming out. Bless all of you.